delegation. Welcome back and thank you for giving up your time and energy to and traveling to El Salvador to witness one of the most exciting, I think, and promising political developments in recent times. You know, it wasn't too long ago. As a matter of fact, uh, skeptics were all over the place predicting that the people of El Salvador were forever doomed to endure the burden of dictatorship. And this was when they were having their first democratic election in many, many years. And it was said they were not capable of self-government and the Marxist guerrillas were surely going to win. Well, the skeptics were wrong. There were any number of fantastic stories of courage of people who walked for miles in order to vote, buses that were burned by the guerrillas to keep people from getting to the polls and all. And again and again, the Salvadoran people defied the violence of the anti-democratic guerrillas and freely expressed their political preference at the ballot box. Yesterday's elections were no different. As in the past, there are numerous reports of Salvadorans walking for hours, even now, to the voting booth. And it's this spirit that's driving the democratic revolution in El Salvador, and I think it's a very promising revolution. In this regard, we all owe a great deal to the courageous president of El Salvador, Napoleon Duarte, whose leadership in these difficult past years has been so crucial to the development of El Salvador's democracy. He was the candidate in that first election that I just described. It's precisely that kind of political transformation from dictatorship to democracy, from arbitrary power to the rule of law, and from coercion to respect for human rights which has been our primary objective for all of Central America, not just El Salvador. What a contrast between yesterday's event in El Salvador and what's going on in Panama and Nicaragua. But the tide of democracy is running strong in Central America, and I'm convinced that it will reach all the nations in that region. But that's enough out of me now, and I think I should call on Dick Lugar and then Jack Murtha for your observations from down there and what you saw. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, for uh, greeting this delegation. Uh, I took uh, the fact that you were going to, uh, in, in our visit uh, with President Wardy on Saturday night, and uh, mentioned that we were going to see you directly. He asked, of course, to give his best wishes to you. Thank you for all of the strong, loyal, and individual, as well as collective support you've given. And I suppose that, that uh, Jack,
I'm not going to make any predictions. I'm just going to say what I believe we should leave him. Are you encouraged to the fire? Will you hold up on Concord Aid until you see what happens from these fire talks? Maybe I've given that in consideration. But I think that I've got to move on. Thank you for your help in all of our successes over the past seven years. Thank you for all you've done to help us restore America's pride and prosperity, its strength and security, and I mean this quite seriously, for giving a new birth to a freedom to people all over the world. As president, I've been given credit for many of the things that were really the work of others or that couldn't have been done without others. As Casey Stengel told the press after one World Series victory, fellas, I couldn't have done it without the players. <laughs> <laughs> you and I have fought many battles side by side. We've won some and we've lost some. But win or lose, like Crosby and Hope, like Rogers and the Stair, the Lone Ranger and Tonto, the House Republicans and this Republican administration have made a great team. The only thing wrong with us is there haven't been enough of us. The, uh, the next Republican president deserves a House of Representatives that is on his side. And this year, I plan to spend my time doing something about that. You've heard of the loneliness of the long-distance runner. Well, you yourselves have been long-distance runners who've time and time again gone to the wall and beyond for lower taxes, controlling spending, and a strong defense. Again and again, you've seen unscrupulous methods used by the majority to beat you when you had things won. And with the economy in a period of record growth, you've had to hear the opposition's phony story over and over about how desperate things are. Somehow, I think that must be the toughest part of your jobs, listening to those outrageous stories repeated on the floor of the House. In fact, I know this will surprise you, but that reminds me of a story. <laughs> it was during World War II, and those of you who were in the service then will remember that movies from Hollywood made the rounds of units in the field a new picture every three days. But sometimes, deliveries got delayed. So the current film was held over, and with nothing to do, everyone saw it again. In the Marianas in the Pacific, one Army unit saw Going My Way with Bing Crosby seven times in a row. Now, Going My Way is a great movie, but after seven times, they'd all come to hate it. <laughs> and one night, they captured 11 Japanese soldiers who had sneaked in from their hiding place nearby to see the picture, too. And while they were waiting for someone to arrive to take the Japanese soldiers to prisoner of war camp, one of our men had the idea of letting the Japanese stay and see the end of the show. They'd also seen it seven times and decided they were sick of it, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, instead of some of the grade B horror flicks they produce around here, I thought I'd give you a preview of coming attractions. And for what this movie business calls the establishing shot, the one that sets the scene, let me say that this year, through November, and beyond into next year, our economic expansion is going to be strong and growing, and the American people know it. Now, that's not what you've been hearing from your colleagues on the other side of the aisle. They talk about the decline of the middle class. 
even though real median family incomes have risen strongly and steadily throughout our expansion. And independent studies show that the new jobs have been, on the average, better paying jobs than those we already had. They talk about deindustrialization de and America's inability to compete, even though over the past 15 months, the volume of merchandise exports has grown four times faster than the volume of merchandise imports, and much of this in manufacturing exports. Industry after industry is reporting an export boom. Some of the boom is because of the dollar, yes, but it's also because, thanks to our tax cuts and deregulation and what they've meant for investment and competitiveness, American manufacturing productivity has increased more than three times as much since 1980 as during the previous seven years. Just two weeks ago, Honda even began, as you know, to export its American-made cars to Japan. Our job in the next few months is to keep the leadership on the other side of the aisle from dramming through legislation that would send the longest peacetime economic expansion on record into a tailspin. You know the legislation I mean. Plant closing regulations, protectionist trade legislation, a huge hike in the minimum wage, which will guarantee unemployment for millions of poor urban teenagers, costly new entitlement programs, and hidden tax increases. Yes, working together, we've kept the rascals in the majority in line, and the stakes in our continued success are high. When economist Jude Wanisky was asked not long ago why the stock market crashed on October, he replied, and here are his words, the perception that the Congress, controlled by the Democratic Party, which is a party of pessimists, believes we must have protectionist trade legislation, we must have tax increases, we must even have a recession. And the fear that Congress might have seized control of economic policy from the administration. Well, thanks to you, in the last several months, we've proven to the world that the party of faith, hope, and opportunity is still in the driver's seat. In a vote you may cast today, you can reassure the world once again. I'm talking about the so-called Civil Rights Restoration Act of 1987, commonly known as the Grove City Bill. Equality before the law is the American standard. We can never allow ourselves to fall short. Discrimination is an evil, pure and simple, and cannot ever be tolerated. Ending discrimination and protecting civil rights are not, however, the issues at stake here. The real issue is that accepting one dollar in federal aid, direct or indirect, would bring entire organizations under federal control, from the charitable social service organizations to grocery stores to churches and synagogues. Over the weekend, a spokesman for the National Federation of Independent Businesses said, there's a lot of confusion out there. The group is telling all small businessmen that it would like to sustain the president's veto so that an alternative can be passed which clarifies who's covered and who isn't. Confusion is exactly the right word. As Bob Michael and Trent Lott said so aptly, the House was given almost no opportunity to amend the bill to make its intent clear. Jim Sensenbrenner was given a one-shot amendment which would have been very helpful if it had passed. But the Rules Committee gave the rest of you no opportunity to strengthen the bill on the floor so that the American public could know for sure what the legislation accomplished. I ask you, therefore, to sustain my veto so that we Republicans can demonstrate our commitment to civil rights and our resolve to overturn the Grove City decision in a responsible manner. With my veto message on the Grove City bill, I transmitted to Congress the Civil Rights Protection Act of 1988 which is designed to ensure equality of opportunity and eliminate discrimination while preserving our basic freedoms. It would strengthen the civil rights coverage of education institutions and accommodate other concerns raised during congressional consideration of the Grove City issue. It would extend the federal civil rights laws to an entire plant or facility receiving federal aid, but it would not single out certain sectors of our economy for nationwide coverage as 557 would. If my veto is sustained, this is the bill that Republicans can all help move through the Congress to strengthen the protections afforded the civil rights of our citizens. 
Well, now let me turn to another area, our national security. If anyone still doubted what you and I have been saying for years, that the road to peace is through the strength of America and its friends, you'd think the INF Treaty would have set their doubts to rest. But apparently it hasn't. The same issue is at stake in Central America today, and the same people are making the same old mistakes. Those who led the fight against our package of assistance to the democratic resistance cannot escape responsibility for what happened. Immediately after the House vote against our package of aid to the freedom fighters, Daniel Ortega called for the complete and total defeat of the Contras. Our critics, the ones who told us that taking pressure off the Sandinistas would move them in a more democratic direction, these critics dismissed Ortega's words as, quote, idle rhetoric. We know now that physical preparations for the incursion began immediately. This incursion is no mere political mistake by the Sandinistas. It is part of a broad offensive that is both military and political. It's meant to deliver a knockout blow to the democratic resistance. And rather than pointing the way to more democracy, the cutoff of aid has also been followed by more harassment and oppression in Nicaragua, including attacks with rocks, chains, and pipes by Sandinista-sponsored mobs on political demonstrations, the harassment of opposition journalists, and the not-so-veiled threats to the opposition parties. Rarely has a political proposition been tested so fully and conclusively. Opponents of our package of aid to the freedom fighters said that little or no assistance would mean more democracy and less war. But just the opposite has occurred. The truth about Nicaragua is getting out. Early last week, for example, I spoke to major contributors to the United Jewish Appeal and got a warm response when I talked about Sandinista anti-Semitism and Sandinista ties to drugs, Castro, and terrorism. I mentioned that Sandinista leaders had been trained by the PLO and that one hijacker who died in a PLO hijacking of an El Al airline was a Sandinista who now has a power plant named after him in Nicaragua. I mentioned the attacks on Managua's only synagogue and I mentioned, too, the line from the Commission on Organized Crime report tying members of the Sandinista leadership to international drug trafficking. This issue is not going away and will be coming back to the Hill again. We're determined to get continued assistance for the resistance. And if we stick together this time, we'll make it. We got a lot of work left before this old cowboy climbs up on his horse and rides off into the sunset. But I have a feeling that when the credits roll up on the screen for the hit show, GOP administration 1981 to 1989 and beyond, the last credit will read, don't miss the exciting sequel, House of, a GOP House of Representatives in the 90s. Thank you. God bless you.
tenor a un arcea e ci sono Me complace mucho tenerlo aquí. Hará mucho para realzar los vínculos que nos unen con el País Vasco. Tenemos tales vínculos, uno de los cuales está aquí presente. Yes, and incidentally, it gives me an opportunity to tell you how much I respect what you have done with regard to eliminating terrorist violence respecto su actuación en la limitación de la violencia terrorista en el País Vasco. Democracy doesn't need that. La democracia no precisa de ese tipo de cosas. Nuestro pueblo ha sido siempre un pueblo que ha defendido la democracia, ha defendido la libertad desde hace ya muchísimos años. Y en este momento nuestro pueblo sigue siendo también un pueblo que ama la libertad, que ama la democracia y esperamos que muy pronto se supere también el problema de la violencia. Estos vínculos, estos deseos, esta voluntad de defensa de la democracia y de la libertad es algo que nos une al pueblo vasco y al pueblo mexicano. Aunque la diferencia de pueblos sea muy gente, nosotros somos un pueblo muy pequeñito y en los Estados Unidos de América son problemas. Pero los vascos tenemos en Estados Unidos algo muy importante. Es esta representación ilustre que son los que nos honran en Estados Unidos. Bueno, y lo hacen muy bien. Y así es. Muchas gracias. Una cosa que tenemos que nos hace un poco exclusivos o únicos es que cualquier persona de cualquier rincón alejado del mundo puede venir a América y hacerse americano. Indeed. En esas condiciones vino también a Estados Unidos nuestro primer presidente. El año 30 y el año 38, José Antonio Guerrero. Nuestro primer presidente vino a los Estados Unidos en 1938. Sí. Quiero entregarle este pequeño regalo como recuerdo de nuestra visita. Es un regalo sencillo, pero tiene un gran simbolismo. Simboliza la autoridad, el orden y el respeto entre las personas. Sí, es un tipo de arma. Sí, es un tipo de arma. 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 Muchísimas gracias. Can we include some of the other ones? Sure. Oh, no. Get in there. Come on, right, get in there. Oh, no, no, no. 
Turn just a little to the side. Póngase un poco de lado para que todo el mundo entre. Oh, you should be in the club. All right, I'll come in. Yeah. Mr. President, that maquilla is going to look gorgeous at Rancho del Cielo. Yes. Yes. You can hang out just a spot to hang. Yes. Que tenga mucha suerte. Y yo, señor presidente, lo que quiero es invitarle si algún día quiere venir a buscar. Me encantaría realmente. Ojalá que lo pueda hacer. again on Friday with the President of the Dominican Republic. Oh, that's right. How do you pronounce his name? Balaguer. Balaguer? Yeah. But he's, he takes a lot of care. You know, he's blind and he's hard of oh, hearing. And so we'll be busy. <laughs> no, that's what the first day called. Friday. Friday. Yeah, that's the whole work. These are between us and it's a pretty good picture. Okay, thank you. Well, a pleasure. 
Ambassador of Djibouti. Well, Mr. Ambassador.
going to be a little late for the shot. Yeah, I missed it, didn't I? Mr. President, the ambassador of Bolivia and well, Mrs. Jacobs. Mr. Ambassador. Mr. President. Welcome. Please stand. Thank you very much. It's a great honor for me to uh, represent my country and Washington, capital of the greatest democracy on earth. Well, and I hope to uh, maintain and improve uh, the relationship between the two countries by fostering a better understanding of our mutual problems. Well, I'm sure we will. I know something of those problems. Mr. President, may I present Mrs. Day? And their nephew, Mr. President. You and I will go over in front of the fire, please. We'll pull it while we're exchanging papers, and then we'll bring you in for a time of picture. Okay. We've been very pleased with your country's efforts of eliminating coca. Am I calling it right? <laughs> doing that in the and we can assure you that those efforts will continue and increase and hope to improve the results of things so far. And your institution of democracy there, we admire very much. Thank you very much. To deliver you a letter recall of my predecessor, and letter credence, and the comments. Right. I think if your wife is between us, and, uh, right. I think you know a little clock there. Right? <laughs> Thank you. Well, Thank you. Thank you. There Thanks. we are. Well, pleased to have you. Welcome to the United States. I hope you'll be very happy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Mr. President, the Ambassador Burkino Faso. Well, Mr. Ambassador, it's a privilege. Well, great nice to see you. I'm always to see you. Very respectful Burkino Faso to you. Uh, thank you very much. Greeting of the people of Burkino. President, my greetings to your president. And Mrs. Cabaret. How do you do? She's an American. Thank you. And 25 years ago, you were I was signed here. Yes. So I was just kind of saying, oh, come back. Yes, come back. You and I will go over and exchange our papers. And we're going to go with the spectrum. And I finished your book. Well, thank you. OK. So, well, Mr. President, thank you very much. You have two great guests. I'll greet you and best wishes. Well, you and I appreciate the relationship that we have. I look forward to you making it even better here. Thank you, Mr. President. All right. Very good. I enjoyed it. 